Uh, goedenavond bij de Q&A van Neil Marshall, uh, regisseur van Doomsday. Hij is uh, hier met zijn derde film en zijn vorige twee, uh, Dog Soldiers, winnaar van Onze Gouden Raaf. En die cent hebben hier ook gespeeld. So let's jump right into it. <laughs> um, I heard Danny Boyle on his uh, DVD commentary of Sunshine say that when they were producing the movie, uh, constantly when they were making decisions, the ghost of Stanley Kubrick was in the room because when you go out and make a science fiction movie, a serious science fiction movie, then that is almost inevitable. So um, I was wondering what ghosts were in the production room when you were making your decisions. Everybody who was in the production room was very much alive. Um, I can't think of any ghosts there, to be honest, because you know, all, all the people who inspired this movie are still alive. Um, in the case of John Carpenter, only just. <laughs> Good point, yes. But, uh, and he's kind of like as a, a ghost a bit when you meet him. Um, but no, 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 real, no real ghosts as such. Okay, but it's clear, I mean, um, you set out to make uh, an updated version, I think, of uh, a number of classic movies from the 80s. I mean, if I'm looking at the beginning of uh, Doomsday, even the computer graphic that shows the separation between London and Scotland reminds me of the one that I saw in Escape from New York that was on purpose, no? Yeah? Oh, every, everything that's in there is in there for a reason. And, uh, you know... At, at, right from the very, very beginning of this film, I, kind of, I was wearing it on my sleeve that this is a, a deliberate tribute and homage and a love letter to all those post-apocalyptic films from that, that period and that whole uh, style of making films. And in some cases, the, the references are pretty obvious. In some cases, they're not. But in those ones, absolutely, I specifically said, I want those graphics to look kind of cheap and 80s-like. And, uh, and that's what they gave me, so... It's also the same about the music. Yes. Well, T Tyler Bates, who did the score, he'd just come off doing 300, he'd done a whole bunch of other movies, and I specifically requested that he do, give, give me something that was both electronic and synth-led for the uh, quieter moments, but then um, be big and bombastic for the orchestral action moments, because that kind of score doesn't really work well with action moments. I don't think this is the synth side of things. Um, you can't beat an orchestra for that, that particular kind of scene. So we combined the two and it was the, the most difficult task for him was in making that blend work well and not just simply jumping between the two. It had to have a, a you know, continuity to the whole thing. What uh, other movies except, except Escape from New York you got in mind when you wrote the scenario? Oh God, there's everything in there. There's a, There's a, there's a little-known British film called No Blade of Grass that came out in 1970, which was kind of a precursor to all the post-apocalyptic post films that we know and love, um, which you know, inspired things like Mad Max and, and Escape from New York. And so it's from that through Escape from New York, obviously Mad Max, Road Warrior, uh, even things like Waterworld. I mean, uh, that, the whole genre... But also, specifically from that period of time, um, the early 80s, when we were all living in terror of nuclear war, and everybody was making stuff about that, whether it be those movies, whether it be things like The Day After or Threads on TV, or it's a good chainsaw next door, um, or the Wild Boys video by Duran Duran. I mean, everybody was getting in on that whole Warriors of the Wasteland thing, so... It's also about because of that we got some 80s uh, hit like Sushi or uh, Frankie Goes to Hollywood in the movies. Oh it's yeah, I, I, I had to, I wanted to try and get that kind of music in the film. And uh, those things, I mean Two Tribes is a great song and I can't believe it's never really been used in a movie before except for the Supergrass. It was years and years and years ago. The Supergrass as a comedy uses it. Uh, but it's never been used since, and I thought, well, this is great for a car chase. I wanted to get Adam and the Ants in there, and uh, Find Young Cannibals is a pretty obvious gag for what's going on. So, it was, yeah, it was that whole kind of era that inspired the movie. Um, as you said, uh, these movies from the 80s took some fears of the 80s in order to kind of have a dystopian fantasy about how the world was coming to an end, right? Uh, now, yeah. you have to make the world end, at least locally, too, uh, f for the beginning of the 21st century. 
So how do you decide to go about that? You went the virus way, for sure. Yeah, well, I mean, it's, it's something that, um, I mean, you were constantly pointing out to me when we were making the film every day, there was something in the headlines about the avian flu or a SARS virus or something like that. I mean, you know, it, it was a bit of a precursor to the whole film. That uh, I think the global threat at the moment is very much viral in, in some form or another. Um, a nuclear war doesn't seem to be so much of a problem anymore. I mean, but, but viral threats, and we know, we know how quickly they will spread, we know how dangerous it will be when it eventually does happen. So, I mean, all these kind of films are, are tailoring towards that. I think it's not a coincidence if there's so many films right now that come out that have to do with viruses. And if you see something like Resident Evil, or I can't remember if it's in Dawn of the Dead as well, but yeah, there's so uh, many films where in the past zombies used to be just no explanation, and now it's all coming from viruses. And there's like five or six films that have the same explanation. I think it's just in the air. Yeah, but a sign of the times thing. <laughs> um, then the movie takes a. I mean, I think a movie like this. The big thing that makes it work is um, the creation of the world in which it takes place, rather than the story, which yeah. functions more as an excuse to be in that world, right? Now, um, wonderfully, the movie takes a complete turn for the surreal uh, uh, doomsday, when suddenly knights turn up, you know, like we're in, in, in Excalibur and in uh, Knights of the Round Table. Um, that was one of the major uh, themes and genres that you like. You wanted to get in there too, or where did it come from? Well, it wasn't so much a, a genre that I wanted to get in there specifically, but it was um, yeah. uh, one of one of the, the the things that inspired this movie in the first place was this image that I had of uh, futuristic soldiers um, squaring off against a medieval knight, and how I, how could I could possibly put that into a story that wouldn't involve time travel. And so when the world of Doomsday came about, this idea of a country which had just been left to die and isolated for 30 years, um, and these soldiers of the future going to visit that country and what might have happened there, that's when it all fell into place. Mm -hmm. And so my concept was that, um, and it's very, very specific to Scotland, that should that country be isolated for how many years, um, where would you scavenge from? What would you go to look for? And, uh, if these people are in a, a state of war, or if they're, they're feuding between different tribes, then the best place to go and like, make your fortress is in a castle. And all the castles in Scotland are tourist venues, and they're full of suits of armor and swords and things like that. So all of this stuff would be at your disposal. So it seemed to me that, that at least one faction would have, have done that. And also with the idea, and it's said in the film, that Cain wants to avoid the outside world. He doesn't want to be seen by them. So he's keeping a low profile and hiding in this castle, which is up in, you know, nobody's going to look in the highlands of Scotland, but everybody's looking at the cities to see if there's any survivors. And it's only when Saul and such like and the marauders in Glasgow betray their existence that the whole thing comes about. So to my mind, it was all about scavengers and who would scavenge where and, and what would make sense. Y a-t-il une question au public Une question publique. Uh, first of all, uh, in case anybody didn't notice, uh, Axel not only appears twice in the movie, but also did uh, a ton of the makeup effects on the movie as well. So um, that's that's. Yeah, but twice tell, tell us about it. Get out about your experience in the movies, and you were involved in the makeup department. Uh, yeah, originally my job was just to write a make enough book of the film. And when I got there, the makeup effects supervisor, Paul Hyatt, who also did the crawlers on the descent, said that the production didn't realize at all that the film was going to be so bloody. And he just, he was there by himself. He didn't have any team with him. He didn't have his crew. And he said, there's no way I can do all these effects by myself. So I volunteered because I had done that in the past, but just mostly just for fun, like not on actual films. But um, he, he taught me how to do the infected makeups and how to sever heads, and there's someone who gets an arrow in the neck, and I did that one too with them. And so many, there's so many bloody, horrible moments in them, and I was behind a lot of those ones. 
And you will do it again in the future. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm, I should be working on the Centune next month or in two months, I think. Again with Paul Hyatt. Well, Une question dans le public What was it like working with Malcolm? I heard. No, sorry, we didn't hear that question. <laughs> um, Malcolm was just a blast. He's, he's such a lovely guy, and he's like, he's been doing this for so many years it, that you know he's not going to piss about. He's there because he loves doing what he does, and um, it was it, he was only there for a week in Scotland, and um, he just made my job very very easy, which is is, is what you want from uh, you know an actor of his stature to come in and have a lot of fun and, and do the role and, and he seemed to enjoy it as much as we did. So, no, he's great. Love him a bit. He, he brings something in the movie? I mean, as an actor? He... Oh, absolutely. I mean, God, I've been watching Malcolm for 30 years, you know, doing this, that and the other and he's very much associated with genre films so I just think, you know, having him in there in the first place is great. He, and maybe the timing was great as well because he'd just come off the back of Halloween. Um, but, I, I, I think he's an excellent, excellent actor. So. You were a fan before. Oh yeah, huge fan before. Also yeah. for or from Bob Hoskins. Sorry. Bob Hoskins also. Oh yeah, Bob Hoskins. Um, huge fan. I, I mean, the thing with Bob is he splits very easily in two in that he does the kind of comedy stuff like Who Framed Roger Rabbit. Yeah, yeah. But then I actually remember him for Long Good Friday, um, and that part is it's, you know they're worlds apart. And I wanted more the kind of the hard edge Bob Hoskins and the comedy Bob Hoskins uh, um, and that's what we got and again he was, he was a joy to work with But how about, how about Rona Mitra this was uh, her first lead part I mean before I've seen her mostly I think <laughs> in, um, in uh, supporting roles I mean I, th I think she even ended up on the cutting room floor of Hollow Man uh, now she had a whole movie to carry as a lead was she a bit nervous about it what was it about like to make her <laughs> do it what was you wanted, do what, do what you wanted to do. Let's say it like that. It was interesting. Okay, I'll so say that, that. That's a long story in one word. There's a Next. very very long story involved. Yes. Next question. <laughs> Encore une question publique, peut-être d'abord. Quelqu'un. Ah. Um, hello. Um, my question is. Um, is it uh, you chose uh, Scotland to be the cut-off land, and then you put Malcolm McDowell in the middle of it? Is there any political commentary to be drawn out of that? <laughs> political commentary? No, I don't think so. Um, I, I'm not. I wasn't entirely sure of the question, but uh, it's to do with. Is there some kind of political commentary to do with? This? North versus South, Scotland, yeah, okay. You, you reintroduced Hadrian's Wall, which used to separate the country in, in two before. Well, it, yeah. Uh, barbarians versus civilization, these kinds of stuff. Well, certainly, um, the building of walls is incredibly topical. Um, you know, it's going on along the Mexican border now. It's been going on for ages in Palestine, it was in Berlin. And then, you know, as far back as Hadrian's Wall and the Great Wall of China, I mean, it's, not, it's not, nothing new. And the whole point about this film was the idea that geographically it could take place uh, along that line because the Romans had proved it 2,000 years ago. So, you know, that, that was the, the foundation of the piece. And it wasn't supposed to make any kind of statement against Scotland because um, without getting too technical, uh, the Hadrian's Wall line does not mark the Scottish border and if you were to build a wall across there, you actually take a big chunk of England as well. So, um, including Newcastle, where I was born. So, you know, I, I didn't want to get into any kind of political statement about it. I just thought it was a lot of fun. Uh, some people seem to like the idea of walling off Scotland. Not me, not me. I like going there. <laughs> so you don't have a problem with Scotland. I mean, in Dog Soldiers, the bad guys live in Scotland. No, they live in Scotland and again. No problem with Scotland for you. Not a problem at all. Okay. <laughs> anyway, the, bad, the real bad guy in Dog Soldiers is very, very English. He's not Scottish at all, so, you know. The werewolf. True, true. <laughs> Anybody else? Noch <laughs> jemand? 
Okay, well, um, let's move on to a little uh, other question, just one that we really need to get off. Uh, you, uh, since last time you came to BIF, you got married. Congratulations. Oh, yes. Uh, <laughs> but not only did you get married, you got married on Halloween. So now I would like to know what costumes were you wearing? It, it was... Um it was an amazing night, and uh, we, we didn't do costumes as such. We did masks. Oh. Everybody, everybody who came to the wedding had to be wearing uh, dark colors, with the exception of Axel. Mm -hmm. And uh, everybody, all the guests had to be wearing masks. And so we had everything from kind of classical Venetian masks to people coming like Day of the Dead zombies and werewolves and all that works as well. And it was all in uh, this amazingly gothic kind of restaurant in... Edinburgh, which is like the most haunted city in Europe and stuff like that. So it was, it was, it was a big Halloween night, wasn't it? It was more a Halloween party than a wedding. And when you look at the photos, that was what it looks like. Oh, we, cut the, we cut the cake, which the cake itself was a haunted house, and we cut it with a machete. So we wanted to have that kind of style to it. <laughs> I guess a chainsaw would have cost a little bit too much. Chain well, that was Axel's idea. She wanted to do a chainsaw, but I just knew it was going to like you know throw cake everywhere and we'll cut through the table and probably through one of my legs. So I thought it was a bad idea. <laughs> with all these masks, with all these masks, you are sure you got married to each other, yes? <laughs> I sincerely hope so. <laughs> okay. Anybody else would like to ask anything? Yep. I know you, you like some, refer some references of, or some tribute to other movies you liked, like the, the one to Deliverance in the Descent. Uh, was it the case, was it the fact in, uh, in Doomsday? Did oh, you yeah, very much so. Um, I mean, the, the, there's, there's some really obvious references, um, but there's lots of subtle ones as well. I mean, obviously, there's, like, there's nods to Raiders of the Lost Ark and, and you know, Excalibur and, and any number of, of other movies in there. Um, but most of them are pretty less, less than subtle. So, but that, that's half of the fun of it. You have to go back and see it again and see if you can pick out. I mean, there's, there's um, in amongst the audience in the, 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 the Marauders headquarters, there's a baseball fury from the Warriors, but you have to you know, look out for him, but he's in there. Oh, he meant? One last question. Maybe one last one for me. Uh, is there anything you can tell us about uh, the sequel to The Descent? Because, well, oh, the only thing I know about this is that it has already a crappy title with the two there. <laughs> so, uh, that, that, was, that was something that got um, kind of passed around in a memo very, very early on. I don't know if that's actually going to be used. The, the, the S replaced by the two, it's, it's incredibly cheesy. Uh, it's nothing to do with me, I swear. Um, honestly, I, I have nothing to do with Descent 2, so I, I don't know. I, well, I, I know of it. I know that they're shooting in the next five weeks or something like that. Um, but actually, to be honest, Axel's going to be working on it more than I am, so she probably knows better than I do. But I, I, um, we're waiting to hear more than anything. But it, I am confident that it's, um, it's coming from the same production company. And the director is the guy who edited Descent 1. And uh, I can't think of a better choice. So it's in safe hands. It's in very safe hands. So we'll see. OK, we'll keep our fingers crossed. And yeah, maybe yeah. we'll encounter it here in a few years, oh, yes. or maybe next year. OK, Neil Marsh, and, and uh, thank you for coming. Thank you for coming. And um, yeah, make it up applause. Thank you very much. Thank you.